Welcome to The Double Stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week, I have my chat with Adam Hamilton. Now, you may know him from his work with LA Guns, but he's also done a whole bunch of other cool stuff that you may not know about. So let's get right to it. This is my conversation with Adam Hamilton. I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, um, and my musical, my immediate, immediate family was not musical, really. But my mother's side of the family, uh, my cousin is Mose Allison, the jazz pianist, singer, songwriter. So apparently that's where my music comes from. But my immediate family really didn't play too much music. My dad loved music and played records all the time. But where I got my wanting to be a drummer at three years old, apparently that's from my mom's side of the family. Uh, that we uh, That's all we can guess. So that sounds like probably some of your earliest memories were drums. Yep, that's what I started out. I, I remember listening to uh, Proud Mary. Um Tina, I can Tina Turner's version of it and just wanting to just like, just made me want to bounce off the ceiling. And I was literally in my diapers and, uh, something just kind of clicked and I was beating on pots and pans and my uncle saw me one day and he goes, you better get him a little drum set. And they, they got me a series of little toy drum sets, uh, that I immediately destroyed within, you know, days. And finally they got me a little pawn shop drum set that I played for a decade Finally, I just begged Santa Claus every year to get me a, a real drum set. And finally, after like 10 years, they he acquiesced and brought me a, the drum set of my life. And, you know, I just I just got bit by the bug early. I don't know what happened. So then throughout kind of your high school age, was that just drums and bands? Oh, yeah, that was it. I mean, I, I kind of got a little bored with the drums at one point and started wanting to, like, make more music and play guitar. So... You know, like a lot of drummers do, you start gravitating to or other things so you can kind of jump around the front of the stage and make more music and write songs. Um, and I, I did have a high school band. Uh, I was the drummer in all my high school bands. But then my senior year, uh, I got asked to be like a guitar player and a singer in, a, in the band that didn't have one. And I didn't have a band at the time. So I did that. And so it's funny I just kind of, I love doing all that stuff. But first and foremost, I think the thing I probably do the best that I've done the longest is drums. Right. And all the production side, did that start early or was that later on down the line? Yeah, I was probably in sixth or seventh grade and I started doing the old thing where I discovered how you take two tape decks and you get the, I got the uh, Radio Shack mixer and then I bounced drums and bounced it back and forth. And I had that epiphany just literally stumbling across it as a kid going, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. And I showed it to my mom and dad. And they said, well, there's got to be a better way to do it than that uh, because the sound quality degrades so much. And they said they looked into it and they bought me a little four track for like 100 bucks and it changed my life. And I, I became the kid who wanted to record all the kids and record all the bands and we do little four track demos over at my place. So yeah, that started really early that I, I've always had kind of a dual obsession. I loved playing live and playing. Um, Cause that was my identity as a kid. I wasn't really, I liked sports, but I wasn't really that great. So I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't like the most popular kid, but once I discovered playing ba in bands, all of a sudden I'm like, that's my identity. All of a sudden, I had a girlfriend. And all of a sudden, people at school knew who I was. I won the talent show. And I'm like, ah, this music thing. It's its more than just music, you know? It's, it's this is my life. And until I got married and have kid, had kids, it was my number one, you know, that was it. That was all that I was into. Uh, thank, like, thankfully, I got a little older and realized there's a lot more in life that I enjoy. But up till that point, it was just, you know, rock and roll was it, man. That was it. So when you finished your high school years or whatever, did you pursue music in school or did you just dive into bands and hop in a van and go tour? I did. I, I try. I, I, well, my mom and dad, I wanted to get out of school to high school early. And so I tried to get out a year early and my grades were terrible because all I was doing was lit at, in Louisiana, you could go play in bars when you were 18. And because my grades were so bad, because music was my obsession, and that's all I, I cared about, uh, I was playing gigs, you know, in high school. Um, 
And uh, so I wanted to drop out of school and just go be in a band. My parents were like, no, you've got to go to college. You've got to get a degree. At least get a music, go to music school. And I'm like, uh, okay. So I kind of just went along with that, with their plan until finally they realized my grades were so bad. I couldn't even get into music school. <laughs> so they're like, just go, go, go. And so I moved off to, to Texas and eventually made, found my way out to Los Angeles. But yeah, I, there, there was, you know, back in the day, you know, there was just, they were always like, you got to have something to fall back on. You got to have a plan B. And I'm just like, I just don't know what that is. What could that possibly be? There was nothing that I could or were, were, was able to do. Um, so they were terrified for me. They were like, how is he going to make a living? How is he going to have a career? How are you going to have a family? You know, uh, and I was just young and naive enough to just not just go. It'll it'll work out. God will find a way for me um, because I don't think he put me in this world and put this music in my soul like he did to just let me fail or to just, you know, let me end up in the gutter. So, you know, I just, I always, I listen, I grew up going to church. I always had a relationship with God. I always trusted God and he just kind of made a little path for me and, and, you know, always gave me a way to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I can, that's all I can figure out. I look back on it at like 55 years of age and I'm like, wow, it's pretty fascinating how the road does this and that and the other. And, you know, you obviously have lots of challenges, but you just kind of dug a little lane for me to, to do my thing, which is a real strange little niche, but it's, I kind of get to do a little bit of everything that I love to do, which is I got to play in a band. I got to be in one of the bands that I love the most. I got to work with people that I dreamed about working with. I got to make records. I got to produce records for people I never dreamed I would work with, like strange people that I wouldn't think I would ever meet or work with, like William Shatner and, and Margaret and, um, you know, uh, Engelbert Humperdinck and, uh, you know, uh, David Hasselhoff, all these really weird, weird random people. Um, but here it is. And that's, that's what I've been, been able to do. And I also always dreamed about doing music for TV and film and I've been doing that for 30 years. So I've kind of gotten to do a little bit of everything that I ever dreamed about, dreamt about doing. And I've just, I don't know. I'm very thankful. You know, I'm th very thankful. Um, I don't have to leave the house nowadays. My studio is in my place and my, you know, Besides having guests come over that I'm producing, I, I kind of work on everything by myself, which is which when COVID hit was kind of was a huge blessing. And then I think at post COVID now I'm kind of like, well, I, I kind of like working by myself. I, you know, it's kind of nice. Uh, I'm not a young guy. I don't love to go into to Hollywood anymore. I live 20 minutes from Hollywood. I don't like to go in there and spend all night in the studio with young bands anymore. It's just not what I love to do. I'm a homebody. I'm an old guy. You know, <laughs> I got a little, I got a little 13 year old and she's got special needs. So it, it means that it, it's better for me to kind of stay close to, to home to help mom out, you know, and her caregivers. Um, but you know, I've got dogs and I've got a place that I love and we just love hanging out at home and pff, getting me out of the house to even go see my old bands or something at the whiskey and on a Friday night. It's like, man, I'm in bed by eight o'clock and I'm up. I take my kid to school and then I'm in the studio working all day and I work. It's almost like a nine to five schedule, you know, but that's, that's what, you know, some of us old dudes do now, you know, and it's, and it's great. Isn't that living the dream? Oh man, it, it is. It's, 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 it's living in the dream beyond what I ever could imagine. Um, you know, uh, dreaming it up because I don't know, man, it's, I feel very blessed. So let's go back to the beginning of your kind of professional music side. I don't really know much about the Brian Jonestown massacre, to be honest, but that seems yeah. to be where the start is. Is that your first kind of professional gig? No, not really. Um, I moved to Texas. Um, I had some friends living in Austin and knew that Austin was a great music town back in the nineties. Um, and I'd kind of like, I was, I was the kid who always laid in bed at night and dreamt about getting discovered, you know, like I just, you know, maybe I'll just meet somebody famous and they'll help me get my big break. And, and lo and behold, that happened. Um, I was in a bar playing in a bar band and at the time poison was, was still 
happening and really big and they had songs in the top 10 and they came to town and CC and some friends wandered in this bar and uh, I saw him and I immediately go, I know who that is. And I went over and we ended up hitting it off and he came and sat in with my band and I went and saw their concert uh, at the Frank Irwin Center the next night. And he pulled me on the bus afterwards and he goes, look, you know, Poison's doing great, but I'm miserable. I want to start my own band and I want you to be my drummer. And that was it. And he moved me out. He moved me out to Los Angeles. So that, that was my first gig, first real gig, first, um, you know, first big break uh, in a series of things that I would call breaks. Um, and so I moved out and played with him for a while. And then, after a few months of that, uh, grunge started happening and I kind of saw the writing on the wall and, um, I knew it was time to move on. And, uh, I, I moved back to Louisiana for a while and kind of regrouped because after playing with CC, you know, I kind of got started on the, uh, the opposite foot because I didn't really pay any dues. I, I didn't move out to Los Angeles and struggle. I, I literally moved into his his uh, ten million dollar house at the top of the Hollywood Hills, <laughs> and and partied with Frank, you know, with uh, oh my. all the rock stars. And Diana Ross lived here, and uh, you know, Madonna lived here. Ice T lived here. Down the street was Burt uh, uh, Burt Reynolds, <laughs> and like I was living that life before I had even like done it. And it was it was kind of weird. And we partied all night and we took photos all day and gotten all the magazines and there was all this hype because the 80s stuff was still kind of, you know, happening. And then I remember watching the Nirvana video um, with him and I just had this feeling I like go, well, this scene is definitely changing. And I was still young enough to like, like Nirvana and like some of those uh, grunge era bands. And um, as much as I liked the 80s stuff, I was into all sorts of different stuff. And so I embraced that that change of scene and knew that it was time to move on. So I moved back to Louisiana, regrouped, and then moved out here to stay. And that's when I started paying my dues and said, okay, now I'm the broke musician. Now I've got to like hit the pavement and find work. And luckily, I, I hooked up with Tommy Thayer, who, who was working for Paul Stanley and uh, – and uh, Gene Simmons and Kiss, and he wasn't in Kiss at the time, and this was before Kiss's reunion. So I had a little band with Tommy called Number Nine, and uh, Tommy would get me kind of like weekday work with Kiss. He'd say, okay, today we're going to go inventory the Kiss warehouse. And I'm like, "Uh, okay, that sounds fun. I was a huge Kiss fan, so that was like a dream come true, and helped him kind of, you know, whatever he needed to do to help put on the Kiss conventions and all that. And then when he joined Kiss and went off to do that, I got a gig with another band um, that was signed to Warner Brothers called God's Child. And that was great. That got me in the van, you know, van touring the country on a, on the major label. And I got to experience what that was like. And I got to also experience what it was like to have the disappointment of your song not getting added to radio and having your record kind of go get released and then kind of sink. Went through a bunch of those situations um, on different bands and different labels and realized that, wow, this this music, music business is crazy, man. Like, w- what a heartbreaking, dis- disappointing business this can be. Uh, even though I'd had this big break, I thought, well, I'm I'm in the business. I'm out here. I made some connections. Uh, I kind of got my big break, but I feel like it was a rocket that got shot off. And now it's kind of like heading toward the ground. And I'm like, what's going on? And then uh, the Brian Jonestown Massacre gig came up. uh, 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 I I had gotten signed to a publishing company with that band God's Child. And me and the guys, I got signed as writers. So we were working in the studio. And the producer that I met, his name was Muddy. Uh, Muddy was, uh, actually he was in LA guns. That's how I got the LA guns gig. Uh, my buddy Muddy was the bass player for a while there. Um, but before that he said, Hey, I'm producing this little indie band called Brian Jones Hill massacre and they need a drummer. The drummer in the studio just passed out. They're like, they were partied all night. He passed out. So I literally came in and he was, the, I was their ringer and he had me play drums on one of their records. And those guys have, have blown up. They're pretty big now. Um, they play all the big festivals in Europe and stuff like that. They're still, an, they're still kind of uh, an alternative band, but they're, 
they were like uh, uh, real, like kind of English sounding and uh, real alt uh, kind of underground. But they're they're doing pretty good now. There's a real great documentary about them called Dig, which talks about them and the Dandy Worlds and their relationship and their uh, how the Dandy Worlds and them were friends, but also rivals. And the Dandies took off, but the Brian Jonestown didn't take off yet. Uh, it's a great music doc. If you hadn't seen it, it's called dig. Um, but yeah, so I got, it's just being at the right place at the right time. I got pulled in to play on a couple of their records and then got another gig with another band signed on a label. Um, and it turned out I was at a club one night, met Adam Dritz from the counting crows and he and I became friends and he signed the band that I was in at the time after the Brian Jonestown massacre stuff. Um, Brian Johnson was trying to get me to join the band, but those guys partied way too much more than I, I could ever keep up. So I just said I had to uh, thank them for the offer and politely decline. But um, Muddy called me up a, about a year later, and, he, and I knew he had been playing bass with L.A. Guns for a while, and he made a record with him. And I obviously loved L.A. Guns back in the day. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm kind of burnt out, man. I've been touring for the last few years in different bands on different labels, trying to get our record to break and just tired of slinging my drums in the back of a van and a trailer. And he goes, well, you want to play bass with Ellie Guns for a while? Cause he knew that I also played bass and guitar and it was just the right time. And I'm like, yes, tell him I'm in. And so he got me an audition and I got the gig and started to come to play bass with those guys and made a few records and just had, had, the time of my life with those guys for years and all these years later, I'm still working with them in some capacity. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's in a, in a nutshell, that's kind of where, you know, how that all happened. But uh, I remember the first year I was out here though, I met a guy at a wedding reception and it once again, being in the right place at the right time in Hollywood, he asked me what I did, and I said, well, I play in bands, but I also want to do music for TV and, and film and commercials and stuff like that. And I said, what do you do? And he said, well, I just started a, a company that licenses music for TV. I'm like, well, isn't that strange? <laughs> that's no, you know, some people would say, well, that's a coincidence, but I don't believe in coincidence. So I, I, literally a week later, I had gotten him some music, and he had already licensed it to a, to a TV show. So that's how that happened. It was just literally things just kept falling in my lap. And I'm like, are you kidding? This is crazy. And so, you know, 30 years later, I've had a dozen songs and diff a dozen movies, 200 different TV shows, uh, six or seven commercials, video games. And I'm still doing that. That's kind of what I call my day job. Um, because I love producing and I love the bands I work with and making albums, but I, I love, you know, putting on the composer's hat and writing for stuff like that. That's, that's, you know, I feel like both of them kind of balance me out. Um, and it's great to get royalties from songs that you did 20 or 30 years that are still airing in syndication. You know, that's, it's just astounding. It's just astounding. You know, I have a few questions based on everything you've, you've just gone through. So yeah. the CC DeVille band, was that the one that Kelly Hansen was in? No, it was before that. That was a guy named Joey C. Jones. Uh, me and Chris Torok, and this was he actually started the first the first solo band he ever did was with Carmine a piece and Jimmy Bain, and it was just a little three piece, and they were just gigging around. But Carmine's always doing a million things, and Jimmy Bain was doing a million things, so that didn't really take off. So they they split. So I think ours was probably like the second version of it, and we made the rounds and all the magazines and all that, but. When that fell apart, he then started the band with Kelly Hansen, Tommy Hendrickson, and James Kodak. And that, that was called Needle Park. But yeah, that was probably the third incarnation of, of uh, him doing a solo band. And do any recordings exi exist of you and CC, or did you not get that far? Nah, we never, we never, we couldn't get it together enough to like write six songs. I mean, we lived at his house. We partied all night and jammed all night and slept all day. And it was just, you know, they'd come up and do a photo shoot of us for a magazine and then we'd go jam. And it was just tons of Hollywood partying and, and 
you know, after three months, it was like, okay, that was fun for a few months. That was magic. That was great. But I'm feeling a little off kilter. I'm feeling like I'm kind of going down a dark path now and this isn't really working out. Ron Jeremy's coming to hang over all of the house too often and it's a little icky and weird. And, you know, I was starting to, to kind of feel the sleazy dark side of Hollywood really creep in and the magic was kind of where and it was wearing thin. And that's when I got on a plane and went back home for a few months and just kind of I needed to regroup. And uh, kind of get my bearings again, you know, before I, um, I was in my early twenties, early twenties. Okay. Yeah. And then with it counting crows, I see you got a little, a little credit on just this desert life. How did that happen? Well, that was because when I met Adam, uh, and in a bar and we just kind of started hanging out, we realized that we had dozens and dozens of mutual friends. And he called me on Friday night and said, Hey, come up to the house. And he's, he had this really cool mansion up in Beverly, uh, up in the hills of Beverly Hills that overlooked all of LA. And he had parties and had all these buddies of his late living there. It was just like this really great party house. And so my band at the time and all our mutual friends would be up there hanging out every other night. Um, and he signed us to his label. He goes, well, I've got a label at Geffen. I want to sign you guys because you're, you're not signed yet. Cause he knew we were having a hard time getting a deal. So he had a, a label, he signed us and at the time, they were working on this desert life. So Adam would come to the studio and be the executive producer on our record. That I, that Chris Seafried, the singer for the band I was in, and and me were the producers on. And he would come oversee it and sing on some tracks and helped us working on the record. And then we'd go up to the studio for the desert live sessions, and we'd hang out with those guys and do hand claps and background vocals and. We were hanging out on their scene all the time when they were making that album. So we just ended up being on that song hanging around as me and my band and a bunch of a bunch of all of that whole scene, all of us hanging out, drinking and partying and, you know, singing background vocals and stuff. So that's that's kind of how that all happened. And then Adam and them, when that when their record and our record came out, they went out on tour and they took us out on tour. And we were the opening band for a few legs of that this Desert Live tour. Um, and then, you know, they continued on and their record, you know, went gold, platinum and double platinum. And our record, we couldn't really get it added at too many stations because we were unfortunately, I learned a lot about the business. And I learned that even though Adam was was a, a famous guy with a record a boutique label and, you know, we were so far down the pecking order because it was through Geffen Records, which was through Warner Brothers, that you know, each each time we would go to alt radio and try to get our song added, they would be like, well, the Chili Peppers new single is out this week and we added that. So we really can't add anything that's under the Warner, the Wea family. And we just kind of watched our record go and crash and burn um, like most albums do or did back in the day. You know, the ones that succeeded were very few and far between even though you look at the charts and all the things that have been successful in the last 50 years of of music you know the 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 ones that weren't successful are you know stacked to the moon and around you know it's just crazy crazy now the county crows they're a particularly good live band uh did you learn anything from touring with them Oh my God. Absolutely. You know, I learned so much. I I don't even know where to begin. The first thing I learned was everybody in the Counting Crows camp was awesome people. The road managers, road manager, they treated you, the opening bands like family. They invited you to catering. They got you dressing rooms. They they would, Adam would come out and introduce us every night and sing with us and sing back up with us. They would do hanging around for their encore and they'd invite us up. We'd get on stage with them and sing every night. Um, They couldn't have been any better, couldn't have been any nicer. And I learned that how much humility and how much cool you can be when you're, when you're, you know, a successful band and not have an attitude and just be really, really cool people. And I will forever appreciate and thank, Adam and all those guys. And we made lifelong friends with, with some of those guys, David Immergluck and Adam and just love all those guys. And I just, I just got to see how the pros really do it, you know? And I got to see like when I was being a bozo and when I was acting like an idiot and, and where I needed to tighten up my, my professionalism, you know? 
in that way, when I, when I got my next gig after that situation, I was like, well, I'm going to do things a little differently this time. Now I get to put into practice everything I learned from those guys, which was just incredible lessons every day. Absolutely. It seems like such profoundly different scenes, the, like the LA guns and CC DeVille fit, but then, you know, counter yeah. you well, know, Well, that's, it's so true. And that's the funny thing about my life is I've always been a chameleon. I've always hang, hung out with the jocks and the rockers at school and the preppy kids. I, I just had friends in all different groups. And as a kid, I loved the eighties music that, that like the dawn of MTV and I loved all the rats and all that. I loved everything MTV played. I loved uh, uh, Michael Jackson. I loved 38 Special. I loved Pat Benatar. I loved the Buggles. I loved Gary Newman. I just loved music so much. And that was the cool thing about it, the dawn of MTV is that I got a little bit of that. Every other video, I'm like, oh, great. you know. And, and I've always enjoyed so many different types of music. And then I've been blessed with to be able to work in so many different genres, which is pretty rare. You know, most people get pigeonholed into one genre of music. Um, I definitely know what my wheel, what's in my wheelhouse, and what I do better than others, um, and try to stay within that. But I love so many different types of music that it's just been such a blast getting to work with different artists. In you know, and I think that I kind of have to attribute that to just my upbringing to, because my dad had, you know, I had Buddy Rich records, uh, Lou, you know, loved, loved, uh, Buddy Rich and Louis Belson and, and Benny Goodman. But then I loved Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles and I loved three dog night. And of course I loved all the eighties metal and I loved Van Halen and Zeppelin. And I just got, I got it from, and then in Louisiana, Louisiana growing up, you're playing blues and you're playing, you know, you got to learn to swing and play in those blues bands with those little cats. So I go to blues Monday night blues jam and I learned to play with all of those playing all the standards. So I just got an education of, of being able to play anything and everything, you know, which is great. I mean, I'm certainly no jazz drummer, but I love jazz music and just have an affinity for it. Um, you know, there really isn't, you know, if it's good music, I like it. Now, you've worn a lot of hats in L.A. Guns, from bass to drums to production to who, who knows what else you've done there. Can you walk me through your kind of L.A. Guns experience? Yeah, well, I, when I got the gig with those guys, I was the bass player. And I was the bass player for a few years. We made a few records. And those guys were really so, such sweet and really treated me like family and like a brother and let me write with them on the records and encouraged me to bring in songs. And so I got to do all that. Um, but the records we were making back when I was the bass player, Andy Johns was producing. So I got to learn hmm. from the guy who recorded Led Zeppelin and, and yeah. uh, Van Halen, you know, and everybody else, and Van Halen and Eric Clapton. And, and just, we got to be a sponge and sit around and lay on couch and say, uncle Andy, tell us about the time Jimmy Page <laughs> and you set the drums up in the hallway of Headley Grange, you know? And he'd be like, well, let me tell you a story. And <laughs> you know, what a, what a, uh, what an incredible recording school to go to, you know, learning from, from him and just, just hearing all his stories. And then, um, I always knew that I wanted to spend a little more time in the studio and producing. And I kind of felt like after a few years, my, my run with those guys, I, I, I was kind of needing to try some different stuff. And I got a, uh, I was producing some different people and I was working with, with a guy who was in that band Phantom Planet. Um, and he and I were producing some artists and we got a, got a producer manager and the producer manager said, well, you know, I think if you're going to really pursue pr producing, you're going to need to come off the road and really focus on that. So that was my cue. And those guys in LA guns were, were completely cool and understanding and gave me their blessing. And by that point, Tracy had started the band with Nikki six called brides of destruction. So Tracy wasn't even there anymore. Um, and I peeled off and just, just became a studio rat for years. Um, and, uh, let's see, I'm losing my train of thought. So after, uh, I always stayed friends with those guys and we always did little side projects and 
worked on certain things. Um, you know, Phil and while Tracy was off doing the, the thing with, with Nikki, which I didn't see him for a few years, you know, Phil and his wife and me and my girl would, would all have dinner and hang out and go to shows and I'd go see those guys. So we always stayed connected. And then, um, how did I reconnect with those guys? I believe when Tracy and Phil got back together and they did a record and uh, they needed a rhythm guitar player and they were getting ready to go on a tour to Europe for like th a couple of months. And they thought of me and they thought, hey, would you be interested in doing that? And it was perfect timing. I had been off the road for like 10 or 11 years and I was kind of starting to miss it a little bit. So I, I ended up playing rhythm guitar with those guys for a tour, and that was fun. And then Tracy and I talked on that tour, and he just said, look, we're going to start making another record after the cycle, and I want I want to make it with you, and I'm going to produce it, and I want you to be a part of it and play drums on it and uh, bring in songs and just kind of help me make it. So I said, yeah, I'm in. And so that was uh, – the then COVID hit. And we kind of went into that full force because we were all in different places. And and we just said, all right, let's just make this. This is a COVID record. And we just started making uh, Checkered Past. And um, that was just obviously a strange year slash year or two, two years for everybody. But I just I felt like that was one of the most creative years of my life because I didn't have any of the distractions of anything uh, else but just being quarantined and staying at home and making records and it was awesome you know for in that respect um as terrible as you know that whole time was um but i've just kind of been working with them ever since so uh and and i played drums on the, the last couple of records just because it seems to be easier that way i did on the re the 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 uh checkered past album because Obviously, we were we were all quarantined, um, and then Tracy just said, "Well, this is working out pretty good. I'm going to do a record with Michael Sweet, and it's going to be called Sun Bomb. I want you to do the same thing, just be involved with that." And he was going to pr he produced it, and I, I ended up mix mixing all those records that I played drums on too, just because it was the easiest thing to do. It just you know, I don't love mixing. Uh, I'm not the best at it, but it just seems to kind of fall in my lap for some reason. And I just, you know, do the best I can, but, uh, it, it sure is nice making a record and then passing it off to having somebody else finish it because they can get such a different perspective on it. Um, but yeah, I feel very, very blessed to be able to be asked to, to help, you know, work with him on that. He's, he's been like such a great musical brother. Um, and then we made a record with Todd Kearns called Blackbird Angels. Um, and now we're working on another LA Guns record. So we're just kind of continuing the creative process, you know, even while they're on tour, they're, we're still writing and throwing ideas, sending ideas back and forth to one another. Now, during the COVID era, you guys released a single called Let You Down. Yes. And I found that to be a particularly strong song. Me too. And different, different than anything I'd heard from them and really great. So can you tell me a little bit about that one? That's my favorite Ellie Gunn song ever. It's it's actually one of my favorite songs ever. They sent uh, a demo of that. I had nothing to do with writing that. That was all Tracy and uh, Phil and a guy named um, Mitch Davis. He's been a, 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 a really, really, really close lyrical collaborator with Tracy on the last few early gun records. They sent me that demo for that song in its rough form. And I haven't had a reaction like that. And I don't even know when I got chills and I'm like, Oh my God, you guys, you guys just wrote something so special. And I don't know. I just tried to not mess it up. That's all I can say. When they sent it to me, I'm just like, let's just let me try not to fuck it up because this is so good the demo itself you could have put the demo out and it would have been great it was just so powerful and emotional and obviously it was probably charged by everybody's loneliness and being in quarantine and tracy was in cold dark scandinavia where he was living part-time because he has a, a child over there and um and his wife was over there at the time um and Phil was in, you know, we were all in different places. We were also, you know, 
uh, it was just kind of a dark time in a lot of people's lives. And that song particularly just was, was, has, is so special. Okay, let's move over to the production side. So you've worked with some legendary producers. You've soaked it all in. Yeah. And then let's walk me through how you transition into the production. Like, obviously, you met a guy at, at a wedding, which, yeah. again, you know, that's not, to me, that's not having things fall into your lap. That particular case is just the power of networking of not sitting there by yourself, but going out and talking to people and networking. Yeah. And that opens all the doors, it seems. Yeah, I think that's good on two levels. I think you gotta go out and meet people as much as hard as it is these days for old dude like me to wanna do that. It's still important. It's hugely important when you're just getting started and trying to make connections in any business. And I think in some giant, huge cosmic way, it your willingness to go out and do that and, and hit the pavement and shake hands and get people's numbers. It just gets the, the, mo the, the ball, the motion ball in motion of, of putting things, making things happen. So I think that that's hugely important. Like you say, absolutely. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I had gotten a chance to produce a couple of things and, and uh, the album that was on um, the counting crows, uh, Adam's label. I got to be a co-producer on that. And that kind of sealed the deal for me where I knew this is something that I want to pursue and, and full time, even if it means not being in bands anymore. Um, I was definitely willing to sacrifice that. Um, uh, and then I met, a, met Brian Prayer from Cleopatra Records and he had me produce a song and he and I became friends and he just liked what I did. I produced, a, we, we remade one of, uh, Jack Russell and uh, Mark Kendall did one of uh, great, their greatest, the Great White's greatest hits, and I I helped them with the music and produced it. And it they liked the way it turned out, and Brian's just kept me working ever since. So he's been your main guy in terms of people like Shatner and whatnot. Is that all through that label? Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. Engelbert Hopperdink, William Shatner, and Margaret, uh, uh, David Hasselhoff. You name it. Everybody that I produced, Ice, uh, Vanilla Ice, <laughs> Leif, Leif Garrett, you name it, man. We've run down the gamut of, of strange and wonderful people. That's all been through Brian. I don't think I can fully wrap my head around just how much fun it would be to be in a studio with William Shatner. You know, I got to tell you, it's hysterical. I'll show you. <laughs> I'll I'll share with you some videos. I mean, of us like doing like Bohemian Rhapsody and Iron Man and stuff like that. Just cracking up to the point where we're like we're both in tears where we have to stop and just take a minute it's hysterical and the the best part about it was you know you work with some people sometimes and sometimes you hit it off and you know maybe you have a relationship and a friendship out of it and out of everybody i ever worked with he was probably the pre person i would think i would least become friends with and have least in common. And I became friends with him and he invited my family over to watch Monday Night Football, you know, back in 2010. And we've been friends ever since. We go over there and watch football at their house and go help him with his charity events. And, you know, I just texted him the other day and, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't think that a, a guy in his 80 years, 80 years old when I met him now in his nineties, I would be friends with, uh, but it's just fascinating, man. It, it, it's it's been a fascinating uh, couple of years for sure. And doesn't he bring on a bunch of guests on his albums? Like you must have worked with some interesting people there. Yeah, yeah. I think um, Cleopatra's idea was they wanted to have guests on the album, and that was a pretty easy w easy way to wrangle people in because you know there's just a lot of William Shatner fans, and a lot of people. You know, uh, rarely did anybody say no that got asked. And then William Shatner also asked a lot of his friends. He brought in Sheryl Crow and he brought in Peter Frampton and he brought in uh, Lyle Lovett and all who were just awesome, awesome people. We got Bootsy Collins and oh wow, you name it, man. We had everybody. Warren Haynes. We got. We even had Johnny Winter when he was still alive play on it. You, uh, Michael Schenker. Uh, I mean, it was. Uh, I, I met. Uh, uh, one of the guys in the Strokes, and he came down and played on. We had everybody on it. It was crazy. It was it was uh, one of the stra this most surreal experiences of my life making that record. Absolutely. And now, are they sending in files, or are they coming into your studio to work? Both. 
Um, Cheryl Crow came in. Lyle Lovett came in. Peter Frampton was in Nashville, so he tracked his. But Peter Frampton is absolutely one of the sweetest guys, most humble guys you'll ever meet. Um, he called me and we talked on the phone and told, asked me exactly what he wanted and sent me pictures of his amp set up and the, the mic. Just so kind, so helpful, so friendly, just couldn't have been nicer um, and more willing to do whatever we needed him to do. But yeah, it, it just varied depending on people's schedules and depending on where they were located. Um, Ian Pace from Deep Purple played on it, but he's in London and he wasn't going to be here. So he did it at his place and sent the files. And it, and it all worked out great, except a couple of them. Uh, we had some Pro Tools file snafus happen where uh, the protocol for sending certain files, uh, it literally, Bootsy Collins sent me his files and it literally came back to me like uh, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle that got thrown up in the air. And then they were like, put this back together. And I'm just literally like putting a jigsaw puzzle for months. Pete, one piece here, one piece here. Oh, this goes here. It was a nightmare. But by the time we got it done, it worked out great. But that was probably the bane of my existence for that record because, uh, I learned a whole lot of what not to do on this record, how not to do it. Uh, files, sending files around. Um, I learned that there's a very specific protocol that I can ask of people and it's really easy for them to do. And it makes my job so easy when I get back to files. I mean, I don't love working with like files like that, but I, I can't imagine I would have had the career I've had up to this point if, you know, the business hadn't changed to what it is now because you know uh they just the, the the way the business used to be and uh just it just it just made it made made it a million more opportunities for me and what i do and to be able to do this here in my own studio and do it th this way and um yeah but it's it's an interesting way to work i mean i i obviously you can't negate the the magic of sitting around and having doing tracks and looking at people and you know getting that energy and psyching each other up there was there was such a fun a fun exciting way of making records and i got to do both which is nice you know i got to be a part of albums on the old way uh and the new way of doing things. And, you know, they both have, have their, their, pro, there's pros and cons to both, but I'm a little bit of, I'm, I've kind of seen the arc of the business now that I've been in it for 30 years to where it's a little bittersweet um, because you know how, how magic things used to be. Uh, but it is, it is what it is, you know, try to make the best of it, you know, the way things are now. Now, do you have a, a special approach when you're working with the older artists um, that might be different than what you would do with, you know, a younger band you're working with? Um, you know, I think that what the approach I take just kind of varies on who I'm working with. You know, I, I kind of, I try to get to know whoever I'm working with as much as I possibly can before we work together. And I kind of try to find out what works for them. Um, and and how they are most most comfortable uh, to where we can get the best results, and uh, you know just doing a lot of communication. That's the main thing. Is I just try to say, how can I help you? What are we trying to achieve? How do we do this where it's the most we come up with the best result, but it's the most enjoyable journey and, and experience for you? Because the good thing about doing it at my place is we don't have um, uh, you know, thousand dollar, two thousand dollar a day studio um, hanging over their head, and you know a lot of these old school artists like Engelbert and Anne Margaret and people like that. They've only worked the old school way, and you know, you get in and you hurry, and there's always that hanging over your head, and the, the you know, and and I say, well, let's come into my studio, and it'll be a lot more laid back, and you know, some of them are a little resting at first, and they're like. You, we can make a record in your house and then they come in my studio like, oh, okay, it's a real studio. And they don't realize that I've got my own place. And I'm like, look, there's no clock on the wall. It, it's, we can, if, if we, if you come out and we're not feeling it today, let's go have a tea. Let's go to Starbucks. Let's go sit outside in the sun and 
chill or let's pick it up tomorrow. It's no big deal. It's not like it's it's time is money and we got to hurry up and get this done, you know, so it can be a lot more laid back. And that's probably the the, the best the best um, thing that the best uh, approach that I have now is is the ability to do that. Um, and, um, and just be laid back, you know, like there's just nothing formal about doing it here. It's just totally fun and, and laid back. And, um, you know, I, I think trying to be a good host is, is half the game with me now, you know, I just kind of hit play, hit record, you know, on, on the pro tools and sit them in front of the mic and figure out, Hey, are you more comfortable standing up or sitting down? I think, you know, some of these artists I'm working with, they're older and they're just, they want to be comfortable and kick their feet up. And, you know, so I just try to make them comfortable and make Ann Margaret some tea like she likes and, you know, keep it nice and, and light and fun. And, and, you know, it's, we're not, it's not rocket science. Nobody's going to die. It's, it's, there's no pressure here. We don't have to have a hit or the record company's going to drop you. It's just, it's nice and easy, which I appreciate. I'm not great with stress. I mean, hey, is anybody great with stress? No. But making records and then feeling stress doing it, that's kind of counterintuitive, you know? That, to me, uh, that just doesn't go well together, you know? You shouldn't feel stress when you're creating art or you're creating music. You should feel free. You should feel excited, uh, inspired. And that's just what I do is I just try to create an atmosphere that's just laid back and... You know, I'll even do the 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 old uh, Rick Rubin thing where I'll just come lay on the couch and take off my shoes and kick back and let them see that they can do that. Let them see that they can like this isn't formal. You don't have to dress up or be proper. You know, we're just kick we're just kicking it and, and hopefully we'll get a couple of good takes and we'll be done for the day. You know? Can you tell me about putting your studio together? Yeah. Part of the reason we moved where we did was when we were buying a house, we, we had a checklist of things that we wanted. We wanted to get out of out of Hollywood a little bit so we didn't have that crazy, you know, uh, homeless people crawling out of dumpsters. You know, just I just got sick of that. I can't handle the, the craziness of the, of the city like that anymore. We moved out to the suburbs and we bought uh, a house that had a separate garage on the on the separate from the house. And I converted that into my studio. And I found a guy that literally builds home studios. That's what he does. And he came out and gave me an estimate and it was the right price. And two weeks later, we started construction on it. And three weeks later, we were done. And I was literally, you know, wiring it up and uh, testing it out. And I literally had William Shatner come in as my first client, 2010, and it was the best thing that I've ever done. Um, and I don't know what I would do if I had to move here because, you know, I, I do drum sessions weekly for different different projects. And I literally have everything set up and ready to go. And I can literally come in here and turn on the lights and turn on the mics and pre's. And in 10 minutes, I can be cr- tracking drums or vocals or whatever else I need to do. And it's just such a blessing. Um you know, I lived in Hollywood for 20 years and never had anywhere I could set my drums up and play them, much less record, you know. So, yeah, it's 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 an incredible blessing to have. And your music for TV and film, that seems to be a big part of what you do now. Yeah. Uh, is, can you tell me what's going on in that area? Yeah. Um, I It go, kind of goes in, in waves. Uh, the first year, first few years I got into it, it was... I was just doing a lot of stuff that was getting placed in a lot of TV shows, a lot of those uh, late 90s stuff, um, everything from Law and Order to, you know, Saturday Night Live to everything, everything that was on TV was I was getting tons of placements. And then I started getting tons of placements on E, uh, a lot of those uh, shows on, on the E network. And then uh, I started getting a lot of stuff for uh, – I started getting some movies. I did um, uh, what the first um, Born Identity with uh, Matt Damon. I had a song in that, uh, What Lies Beneath with uh, Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Pushing Tin with uh, – oh, God. Who Kevin was Costner, that? I think. Kevin Costner and uh, John um, – 
Oh man, my uh, dementia's kicking in. Um, oh God, it had everybody, Billy Bob Thornton in it, and you name it. Just tons of movies. Uh, the, the, what was that movie with The Rock? Uh, the Tooth Fairy had a song in that, a song with, in The Rock of Ages, the musical. And then I started getting into a lot of sports stuff. Uh, ESPN started using a lot of my stuff. NFL Network did. And it varies. Uh, everything from the Cooking Channel to Discovery Channel, everything. The only network that's not used any of my music is Bravo, and which is kind of a bummer because my wife watches all those housewife shows. And she's like, never hear your music and, and anything on Bravo. I know, I know, but that's all you watch. So if you watch some of the other networks, you probably hear a lot of it. <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. It just you never know where it's going to end up. I mean, I used to get calls all the time saying, "Hey, guess what? You get a song in this movie, a song in this TV show," and it was all very exciting. And then, thankfully, when things picked up, it just became so much to where it, I would just literally get my ASCAP account, my check, and I'd be like, "Whoa, I had a song in that. I had no idea," um, which is exciting and fun you know uh but you know as the writer of it sometimes you're the last to know but you know as long as you're getting paid that's what matters so uh yeah man that's what i was just working on before i talked to you i was working on 10 new songs for a bunch of different stuff that uh, almost kind of sound like the black crows kind of rootsy kind of rock and roll with vocals and stuff and uh What's fun is I get to a lot of these because I'm not really a singer. I get to hire my friends and have them come in and sing on it. And uh, my buddy Patrick Kennison, who plays guitar with Lita Ford, he plays on a lot of my stuff and does a lot of singing for me. And Jason McMasters from uh, Dangerous Toys and Broken Teeth just sang some stuff for me. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, it's great having had have those friends and those friends have little studios in their place so they didn't even have to come see me i mean patrick just moved to dallas from here um he and his wife now live in dallas and jason lives in austin so they just i send him a file and they send them back and we're good to go now on this stuff on the music side do you play most of of the music yeah on all this music i do the music and then uh if it needs a, a fancy guitar part, like some leads and stuff that I'm not able to do, like if it's outside of like a Keith Richards meets Johnny Thunders lead, I got to hire my, my buddies to come in. But everything else I do. So it sounds like you're a pretty busy guy. Like you balance a lot of different things. Yeah, it is. It's wearing a lot of hats, but it's it's great. And I still have, an, you know, I'm able to spend enough time uh, with my family and take care of my little girl and help my wife. Um but yeah, man, it definitely keeps me busy and it keeps me making music and paying the rent. So I'm a pretty happy guy. Okay, that was Adam Hamilton. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Coming up, Jeff Pilson comes back on the show. And after that should be Vinny Apice. So lots of good stuff coming. Until next time, thanks for listening.